Well, I'm here with Professor Patrick Ford. It's a delight to be with him, a mentor, a scholar, a teacher, and a wonderful human being who has influenced myself and many, many scholars. Professor Ford has been uh, influential in many parts of Celtic languages and literatures. He's done work on medieval poetry, the role of the harper in medieval Ireland and Wales, and uh, on many aspects of Celtic mythology, as well as on the issue of translation itself. And he has given us so much to think about and so much help. So my students and I, in my current class of Celtic mythology, have some questions for him about his life as a scholar and his loves as a scholar. So thank you so much for talking to us today. It's a great honor and pleasure. My pleasure, my friend. (laughs) So we were just interested in how you got started in Celtic studies and what drew you first to the field when you began. That that is a a big question. Yeah. I mean, it's a big question for everybody, isn't it? I mean, how did you ask anybody, how did you get, how did you get interested in this field and so on? Yes. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to give you a roundabout answer. We like um, that. (laughs) Because... um, you know, I wasn't born with an interest in Celtic studies, <gasps> right? I know it's a, surprise. it's a great surprise, <laughs> but I must say that 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 as far back as I can remember, I was always interested in language, mm. in, in in the abstract, yes. just the idea of language. I, I used to I used to um, recite poems that I knew backwards, you know, and and do I kind of crazy things that. like that with with, wow. with language. Uh, my my father, who was a great man, um, always whenever I asked him. Uh, what a particular word meant, he said, look it up in the dictionary. And so the dictionary became kind of a close friend. I bet. Right? Yeah. And then, um, and then it went from just the idea of language to languages. And when I was in high school, I ha- had um, three years of Latin. Uh, and then in college, I had two years of French and two years of German. Uh, and then after that, I studied uh, ancient Greek, Homeric Greek. Um, and then after that, there was uh, what? There was Middle English, and then there was Old English. And that was in, that was after I graduated, and this was you know, I was working at other things, but I um, still kept taking courses, mm-hmm. you know, thinking that. Who knows where this is going to lead? But I think I was following my nose, basically. And yeah. what I've always told anybody that was interested in asking, you know, uh, what should I do or whatnot, um, follow your nose. Mm. You know, something inside you will tell you where you're headed or yeah. where you want to go. And it may not always be easy to get there. There may be lots of impediments, but, uh, you know, if you can do it, do it. So I studied uh, Old English with Bill Heist, who at the time I didn't know uh, what a fine Celtic scholar he was. This was at Michigan State. And then I had a course in Beowulf uh, from William Whalen. Um, And that goes to question number three, Mm. the most influential person uh, ever. So tell us about Bill Whalen. I I can only tell you that... um, he wore his very deep learning very lightly. Mm. Uh, was good at the Socratic method. Um, uh, never held himself aloof from his students and so on. I mean, he was just that that kind of a person that, um, you know, he said, that's what I want to be. Mm. And um, Well, it sounds like someone I know, actually. <laughs> no, he, well, <laughs> I wouldn't know who that might be. Um, anyway, so it was about that time. Um, and I realized that what I wanted to do was medieval language and literature, and that it was going to be Old English, and I wanted to be a Beowulf scholar. Ah. And um, so I, one day I saw this advertisement for fellowships in Celtic languages and literatures at Harvard, and I said to myself, um, Celtic, that's sort of Northwest European that's sort of near Old English and Beowulf and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, maybe I could, if I could get this fellowship, I would go there um, and work my way, sort of come in through the side door. Right. So right. That's, that's how I came to Celtic studies, through the side door. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then did and you William just... Whalen was one of the people who wrote uh, a recommendation for me, and so did Bill Heist and uh, some other nice people. 
So at the age of 30, I sold my house and sold one of my two cars and packed up my spouse and my two small children and came to a little tiny flat at the corner of Prospect and Broadway in Cambridge. Wow. And so we did that. And that was following the nose. Did you think even then that you would return to Old English? I had no idea. Yeah. But after the first year of doing Welsh, I was hooked. You were hooked. Yeah. I loved that. Was that was it. Yeah. And did you stay in touch with the teachers who had met yes, you? Yes, I did. You? Yeah. William Whalen became a very good friend, very close friend, so did Bill Heist. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, it's you know so one of the pleasures of scholarship. I I think mm-hmm. you know and you know as you go through that you build these kinds of relationships uh, just as you would maybe in lots of other fields. But I think um, in scholarship, at least in our field, maybe not in all fields of scholarship, but certainly in our field, uh, it's an easy thing to do because there are a lot of good people who have very open minds. You know, we know how difficult yeah. the field is, how much work you have to put in, and so. Um, Nobody slights the efforts that other people have made. Here, here. You know, even yeah. if you don't agree with them, but I mean, you say that you, you know that they've put in a lot of hard work and a lot of time. On that note, exactly of hard work, what do you, what were some of the challenges for you personally, or also even in the broader field in, of Celtic and getting started and making progress as a Celtic scholar? Well, I, I think the biggest challenge is, is the language. The Celtic languages are, are difficult. And yeah. um, there's you can't really work in this field unless you work hard at the languages, as yes. you well know. Yes, indeed. As you have done. Um, so there, there aren't really any shortcuts. It's not the same as someone, let's say, who has been reading since the age of six and takes a you know, a bachelor's degree in English literature and has read Jane Eyre and everything else and then goes and does a PhD in English literature. You know, we've been doing this stuff your entire life. Right. Um, but suddenly, you know, you've got these incredible challenges and you probably would ask yourself many times over, um, what did I do this for? <laughs> <laughs> what a fool. <laughs> yeah, this, this is hard. This is hard. This is really hard. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I think I had some doubts, you know, after the, my first sem- semester, um, thinking, well, you know, uh, if I don't pass any of my courses, um, well, you know, i just go back to doing whatever we were doing before and then be the B. end of that, plan B. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think that there are always those kinds of challenges and you simply work through them, you know. Yes. It really isn't... There isn't any other alternative, really, except yeah. to keep working and working hard. Um, and again, in our field, uh, the pitfalls or the roadblocks are not, I think, as great as they would be in some other fields um, because there is uh, an understanding, I think, on the part of those who you know were in, were before us yeah. um, to know that we're facing the same kinds of struggles, you know, and the, um, definitely, I mean, I was in an English department at Stanford for two years and in an English department at UCLA for, and a large English department at UCLA for, uh, 21 years. Right. And I saw a tremendous amount of backbiting and really wicked and unkind yeah. behavior on the part of one faculty member toward another. Or faculty members who are saying, uh, no, I won't be on your committee because so-and-so is your head of committee and uh, I don't like anything he does and so I won't even be on your on, on your committee. But that sort of thing, it, go, yeah, it, yeah. it goes on, it goes on. Do you think that's partly than, because those fields have been picked over so well that it, there's not it, it that much be. space sometimes? It could be. It could be, but there's really no excuse for it, I think. No, 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 yeah. it, there isn't. But I remember somebody saying that Celtic was the Wild West of scholarship that... <laughs> it was, you know, the undiscovered land. The wild northwest. The wild northwest. Of, of scholarship. Yeah. 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 Well, you've worked so, you've worked over a lot of, of that land, you know, in terms of the literature and the language and certain themes that have caught your attention. And you've produced, uh, one thing that has impressed all of us in, in my class is the, the beauty of your translation of the Mabinogi. So lots and lots to choose from. And maybe it's asking for a favorite child, but is there anything that kind of stands out among all of your scholarly 
production that you particularly feel fond of? Yeah, I think probably there there are a few things, but the the translation of Abenogi that that's a, that's a very uh, funny kind of thing, really. Um, I had uh, applied for and received a um, senior Fulbright research grant in 1973 um, that enabled me to go to Wales and spend a year there, um, and um, that my plan was because I was. It's, very much in the mythology camp at that time. Yeah. Dumézil was very big in those days, and the whole Indo-European tripartite, this and that, and the other thing, and so forth, was very big stuff, and I was hooked on all of that very much As so. everyone would be. As, every, yeah, as everyone would be. <laughs> um, it's not as much in vogue uh, these days, but uh, uh, even so, so I, my idea was that I was going to write the work from the perspective of Indo-European mythology on the mythological backgrounds of Welsh literature, in particular the Mabinogi. Okay. So um, off I went to Wales. It was a great year there, uh, trudging up the hill to the National Library uh, every day. and I mean, you know, yeah. it was great. Beautiful. Um, we swore there would be no television and no automobile. Um, and then wow. after we were there for about two weeks, we got a television set and <laughs> bought a car. <laughs> um, but anyway, as, as I looked at the available translations, I was sort of pouring through and looking for my themes that I wanted to explore in the Mabinogi, the four branches and so on. I was just dissatisfied with, with the translations that were there, I mean, mm-hmm. because they were sort of gave an archaic like feel. Like Charlotte Guest. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and even the Jones and Jones translation, you know, <clears throat> So I thought, well, I, I think I'll translate uh, the Mabinogi afresh, and then I'll work from my own materials. Right. Well, needless to say, the book never got written, but the translations just get uh, <laughs> done, and um, and uh, and and people like the translations, and the book, um, as you know. Six years ago, the uh, University of California Press brought out 30th anniversary edition of it. Yes. It's never been out of print. That is, it's been really in print something. for 36 years now. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. obviously, there was a need for something that felt more contemporary. Yes. Because, after all, uh, when the Mabinogi was written down, whenever exactly that was, um, it wasn't archaic. That's it right. It was contemporary literature. You know, it was modern. Yeah. Uh, to those readers, so that has always been my take on translation. You know that things translated texts should read as fresh for the audiences at which they're designed now as as they were for the original mm-hmm. audiences of those. And my translations of poetry and everything else, you know, have been always been driven by that same. I that love same that, idea. and that's the word that <clears throat> that I use in my mind when I think about your translation. Is there's a freshness to it, and the there's the characters are somehow on par with us. Like we are not looking back at those quaint people in his pseudo history or mythological history. No, that throws they everything here. throws everything off. Yes, there's a kind of respect, I guess, is what I mean in your translation of of the Mabinogi. And which is why I think um, you know, in, at least in part, uh, what has lured me away from uh, purely mythological. Uh, approaches mm-hmm. to the literature, to uh, sort of uh, the literariness, uh, literary analysis, and literary appreciation uh, of those texts. So that um, you know, while I whatever I said and have said over the years about the fourth branch of the Mabinogi, Math and Gwydion and, and all of that, um, the most recent thing I've written on the Mabinogi, which is just very very recently uh, published, um, is about why Gwydion goes divi- uh, disguised, Gwydion and his guys go disguised as poets to ask for pigs. And it's all about the asking and thanking poems that were very popular in the 13th or 14th, 15th, 16th century wow. in Wales and so on. And so that, I mean, that sets it in a cultural context uh, that is not mythological but rather uh, social. Mm hmm. And, and contemporary. That's a, a great way. story because it shows us how many doors into this material there are. Yeah. 
Yeah. Endless, really. Yeah, it's like the man says, it's all handles. You can get a hold of it anywhere. <laughs> I love that. Mm. I love that. Thank you for that. Looking, looking at, your, at your life as a Celtic scholar, are there any moments or any even events or any of the work that you've done that particularly stands out that you say, oh, I look back on that and it really shines? <laughs> Every now and then, but not very often, I'll go back and read something that I've written. 20 or 25 years ago or 30 years ago or something like that. You say, that's pretty good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> say, well, that's not bad. You know? Not bad. Yeah, you didn't know yeah. much then, but I mean, you know, that's not, that's not bad. <laughs> no, I, I think it, that's very hard to say because um, many scholars have, have an agenda, you know, and, and they, they, they want to work on... Um, Christian poetry mm. uh, of uh, late antique or something like that. Right. And that's what they do. That's what yes. they do their entire career. That, um, the only thing that's really driven any of my work is, you know, as I go through a reading through texts and so on, is, you know, that the, the just question marks pop up all over the place and say, why is that? You know, what, what's going on here? Uh, <clears throat> over the years, students have, uh, have said, you know, I don't know what to write about. I said, well, just read. You know, read something, and it'll tell you what to write about, because mm-hmm. there's so many, you know, read with an open mind. There, there are questions, and, and, and many, most of them are unanswered so far. So say, why, what is going on here? Why is this happening in this particular way? I love that. So, so that's... Um, so my work is... I, I've written on Irish literary texts. I've written on uh, mythological texts. I've written on the Toyn, the Cullen, you know, and all of that business. The I've beards written, of the Elif. Yeah, I've <laughs> written on the Godothan. I've written on, on, on the um, uh, the poets of the princes. I've, I've written on the poets of the nobility. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's just w- yes. whatever comes up. That's my agenda. You know, it's just what, whatever is there. Uh, oh, wh- whatever, whatever feels, whatever cries out and says... I'll bet you don't know why <laughs> why this reads the way it does. <laughs> no, I don't, but I'm going to find out. Or yeah. at least I'm going to try to find out. I love that. So um, I suppose that, you know, the Taliesin material uh, uh, would stand out in a way simply because um, uh, it, it, I worked at that for such a long period of time. Mm. <laughs> um, I went discovered 25 manuscripts that, you know, uh, that had this text in it it's when I was working at the ni- uh, that year in 1973-74 when I first uh, began working on that and um, so you know, there was all of that material and I finally got around to uh, picking the, the the most complete text, the only complete text uh, which was a 17th century text um, and so I edited that and did all the you know the front material and so forth and so on and shipped it off to the Board of Celtic Studies of the University of Wales Press. And after six months or so, you know, when all the readers when had been done with it, it, they came back and they said, "Well, you know, that's very nice, but this is not the oldest text. The oldest text is a 16th century text." And I said, "I know that, but it's not complete." And I didn't want to f- have the text and fill in the the missing portions from another manuscript. I wanted one complete manuscript. Right. They weren't buying that. So, uh, that's sh- that's a very it, interesting. Anyway, it shows where the values are. Like, yeah. which one is more valuable? And but you can see how they could each be so valuable: the yeah. complete text or the oldest text. Well, you know, there, there's <clears throat> there, there there are lots of sort of um, uh, what should I say um, gibbons, you know, in scholarship. You know, one is or used to be older is better. Yes. Uh, not necessarily, you know, more complete or right, right, a, a bias, definitely. So that, and and then um, uh, another piece <clears throat> was a paper that I gave at the Edinburgh uh, Conference in 1995, uh, the International uh, Congress of Celtic Studies, and then later was published, um, and it had to do with early Irish nature poetry. Mm. Um, and there had been some discussion about that. People originally thought, you know, this was written by monks who went on R&R out into the countryside and they sat there and wrote about birds and, you know, things like that. 
Um, and that was Robin Flower, you know, that's yes. way back in the old days, and Kuno Meyer. And, and, and then, uh, more recently, people are saying, no, these only exist uh, primarily as examples of different meters in the Bardic grammars. Right, because they couldn't So they're believe, exemplary, because yeah. they couldn't really be, uh, they couldn't use praise poems for so-and-so, uh, because that would be singling him out. So they just, they, they, in other words, it was neutral. It was sort of everything wash clean. Right. So... <clears throat> I thought, well, you know, that, that's interesting, and that's all well and good. Um, um, and I thought, it, where does this poem occur? Well, it occurs in the bottom of a page in a manuscript in, at San Gallmet Monastery uh, in Switzerland. Uh, manuscript number is 902, if I recall correctly. Um, and it occurs as a marginalia at the bottom of a page in a section of um, a Latin treatise on grammar, um, I think uh, Prussian's grammar in a section of the grammar that deals with where uh, Latin pronouns are placed. In other words, why you say me cum with me instead of cum me. Right. Because it's more euphonious. Yes. You know, you say yeah. te cum and so forth. And then they gave lots of other examples about where Latin pronouns are, are placed. And here at the bottom of the, the page is this poem in Irish which has infixed pronouns, affixed pronouns, independent pronouns, and all the rest of it. So, um, so I said, we don't know when that poem was written, or for whom, or by whom, but we know why it is where it is, why, why it was rescued and why it was saved. Because as the scribe is copying out this manuscript of all, about pronouns, he thought, Boy, look at all our Irish pronouns, because uh, Latin doesn't have any of these kinds of pronouns. <laughs> right, so the title right. of the article is published was Blackbirds, Cuckoos, and Infixed Pronouns. I love that. So I think it's one of my um, I love that more cherished titles. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. <clears throat> it seems, that seems to pick up on a theme of your, of your work, which is, A, working from the questions, which I learned so much well, from you about. That's, is, that's exactly it. That you know. follow your nose, and what's there yeah. to do, and B, what's the context? Yeah. Let's see things yeah. as whole. That's right. Rather than, it seems to me that's been your thing, it's like, let's, let's get out and see what the whole thing is, rather than isolating and pulling apart. What some have called uh, cherry-picking. Yeah, yeah. You just pick this little th phrase or thing out of a text, you know, you pick this out from here and then you make yeah. something about it, but it, you have to look at the whole picture. But to see that wholeness is exciting, yeah. I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it is. It's very, very cool. Uh, many of us in the class were curious, since everybody has read you now so many times in the Mabinogi, do you have a favorite <laughs> medieval tale and it can be outside the Mabinogi or inside? That's hard to say. It is hard, I know. It's, it's hard to pick. Uh, it probably changes changes for me, anyway. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I've taught, over the years, I've taught Branwen many times. Yes. Um, I've taught math many times. I've taught mm -hmm. Puith many times. Um, in fact, when I got bored of teaching Puith, and Branwen over the years because they were the only two texts available. Right. That was when I decided to edit the other two branches of the Mabinogi. Right. Uh, to get it so that not only we'd have something fresh for my students, but also something fresh for me. So I was getting <laughs> bored teaching those two texts all the time. <clears throat> That's how it happens. That's how it happens. <laughs> That's probably how those things get done, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So necessity is the mother of invention. That's what, the that, truth. what they say. That's the truth. So, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, I'm very fond of, of the fourth branch of the Mabinogi. Um, but also, I, I, I taught the mm. time for yes, a of number course. of years. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's great stuff. Uh, a lot of unanswered questions there. Oh, definitely. Would you say that any of these stories or themes have influenced you in your life? Like, have they come home to roost in you so that you can see their influence? I don't know, just the way that they sort of leave a track in you, when you, especially when you study something for a long time, it begins to open up to you, I think. I, I don't know about that. I, I, I would rather see it as a kind of complementary relationship. Okay. 
How, how so? Well, that, that, that you're interested in this particular tale, not because it influences your, your life, but because it has something that you see in it, that you're attracted to it, and um, uh, mm. if, if this were possible, that it would be attracted to you as well, you know, right, that right. your mentality suits this particular body of material or this yeah. kind, of, kind of thing. So, Sort of you're in yeah. tune with it in some Yeah, so, it, so it's not an influence coming over the top like that, but I mean, it's sort of the... This, this stuff is all already there in place for you to be receptive to this text. Well, it's yeah. kind of like we've talked about before, uh, ideas about what is the nature of the relationship between the reader and the text itself. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of where you're going? That this sort of sympathetic and cooperative relationship between readers and not just producers of text, but texts yeah. themselves. Yeah, I, I, I think you could say that, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we make it together, kind of thing. You know, it yeah. it, it derives yeah. meaning because of the transmission both ways. Right. I I love to read contemporary fiction. I read a lot of it, um, but there isn't anything in me that would induce me, you know, to write essays about uh, the stuff that I read. As much <laughs> as I love it, I, you know, yeah. I'm crazy about Barbara Kingsolver's uh, novels. Um, I mean, and lots of other people's as well. But, you know, it, it, it's not the same thing. Uh, it's not the same kind of attraction. Is it? There's just different it's questions. Not, what, so yeah. why, I wonder, would you, you still be wanting to chew at the bone of Celtic and then to have a different relationship, say, with, with contemporary fiction? I don't know. That's a hard question. It is. That's a mystery, maybe. No, I'm right. I think you have to answer that. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> so when we look, you know, Celtic has changed even in the years that I've been in, and, and we are sort of roughly contemporary in the Celtic department because you came the year before I came. Mm-hmm. Looking ahead, do you, you see any trends or do you have any forecast of where the field is going I, or changing? No, just a lot of worries. The demographics are not good. Tell uh, me more and, about that. And also the... Um, the um, what should I say? The, the curriculum, uh, curricula, um, and the budget situation in universities. Um, Yoji uh, Joseph Nodge is the only one left doing Celtic at UCLA. Yeah. Um, when he retires, they won't hire another Celticist. Right. There's no way. I mean, they won't yeah. do that. I mean, we're t- talking about an English department with, with 60 or 65 faculty. Yes. Yeah, you know, they're going to hire another Victorian scholar or something. Of course. Like that. Yeah. Um, the <clears throat> the uh, Celtic department at Harvard is aging, but I think that's that's a little ha- uh, happier situation. I think they will fill both of those positions. You know, when those people retire. Um, but uh, the University of Georgia, um, the person who's the professor of Celtic down there, you know, when she retires. Uh, they're not going to replace it. Most yeah. of the people who are in those positions now, and there aren't very many you know, around the country, there's Berkeley and there's UCLA and there's um, Georgia and there's uh, Michigan, University of Michigan and so on. Those people were hired in Celtic when, when such luxury, luxuries could be afforded yes. by yeah. budgets. They can't any longer. So as these people age and, and disappear, I, I think the future is not, not terribly bright. Yeah. For that, and so I don't know what's going to happen unless budgets, you know, go back to 1960 or 1970 or something That's like that. True. You know, when those yeah. situations can uh, can change. So it'll be difficult. I, I, other than that, just general intellectually in the field, there's a lot of very very good work being done. There's a lot of stuff online now. I mean, you know, you mm. um, you don't have to go to the National uh, Library of Wales to the, look at the Black Book of, Book of Carmarthen, or you know, I mean, you can look that at all this stuff things. online. And the same is true with, you know, the online and the concordances. I mean, <clears throat> I can't tell you how many times I've gone through the corpus of Davida Wilma's poetry when I'm doing some sort of addiction study of something, you know, looking for particular phrases and, and right. words and their appearance to, so that I can really hone in, zero in on, on, you know, what a particular phrase might mean in a particular poem. Um, you don't have to do that any longer because it's an on- online concordance. 
It's amazing, isn't it? You know, you just yes. pick the words. So, so the digitization of the things. resources are great now. Yeah. When I was yeah. starting out, there was not a complete dictionary of the Irish I language. I wondered about that. Uh, yeah. there, was, there was not a, a complete dictionary of, uh, of Welsh. Uh, the idea, you know, it's not complete. So you had to sort of look at edited text that had glossaries and, you know, and, and look at a lot of different kinds of stuff. And, um, wow. Yeah, so it's very different now. So that that's encouraging. It is. And so there is some resources, at least, yeah. and human resources anyway. Yeah, you don't need to have a very, you know, uh, big grant to enable you to go overseas to, you know, look at these uh, uh, resources and so on. You can do it all online. So maybe computer. we're returning to an era of hedge scholarship in some ways, you know, <clears throat> that because I do think there is still such a hunger and an interest when we put these materials in front of people and they recognize the vitality and also the interpretive possibilities of these materials. There seems And then so there are much. people like you, Kate, <laughs> who are carrying the torch and doing such a fantastic job. Well, thank you very much. the courses that you teach you and know? your dedication to the Irish language and all the rest of it. Oh, I love it. So. It's a great, you know, the links of the chain, all yeah. of us, you yeah. know, and uh, we're passing it all along. It keeps going. Yeah. But. So just a final question. Um, why do you think we, we love these things so much? <laughs> it's a big question, but the, the, we are so drawn to these materials, many of us. Even people without a heritage in it say, I love that stuff. Do you like pizza? I do, actually. Why are you drawn to pizza? Because it's round. and <laughs> 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 I like the word. Because <laughs> it's good. Can we just come to that, maybe? Sure. Okay. That's my answer, then. That's it. Because yeah. it's good. Because it's good stuff, yeah, isn't good it? good stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. It's well, thank you. Thank you. Thank my you pleasure. for all you've done in the field and also as a teacher I've learned so much from you in your scholarship but also in your teaching and your your relationship and your passion for this material has inspired me right from the moment I met you and still does today and I'm my flattered. students and I just appreciate this opportunity so mm -hmm. much so we thank you very much Professor Ford you're entirely welcome <sighs>